Today I'm joined by Lydia Lassila. Lydia is quintuple Olympian, that means five Olympic participations, Olympic champion 2010, bronze medalist 2014, 18 World Cup gold medals, 16 World Cup silver medals, 10 World Cup bronze medals. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you. Thanks. Lydia, you particip participated in the sport of aerials. Can you explain in a few words what that sport is about? Freestyle aerial skiing is basically skiing into a big, um, big icy jump um, at about 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. And I used to hit the biggest size jump, which is the triple kicker. So then you launch your body off the triple kicker. You do three flips, hopefully, and with multiple twists and try and land and ski away on your feet. So it's, it's a quite, quite a busy sport. Not that much time in the air, but we, we go very high and it's, yeah, it's quite high risk. Yeah, cool. What does it take to perform and land a quad triple somersault? Yeah, quad, triple, twisting, somersault is, um, there's a lot going on in that trick. So every jump, you know, you're in the air for about three seconds. So you're doing three flips with four twists. So um, it's really important to, to have the right takeoff off the jump, the right speed, the, the weather has to be the right. Um, you have to then read where you are in the, in the air correctly and, and be able to spot the landing and to, to be able to ski it away. So, so it's, um, there's so many technical things happening and at the same time you are dealing with fear and you're dealing with um, variables that you can't really control, which is like the weather. Mm. And just for clarification, I mean, that is a feat that has never been done before until you did it and was considered not possible for women, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess when I first started the sport in, you know, 2000, um, women were miles or light years away from ever being able to do a quad twisting triple somersault and it was just thought that no one was going to be able to get there and and I had a bit of a problem with that I, I wanted to prove that it was possible but um so it was nice to be the first woman to do it and since one other woman from the US Ashley Caldwell has has competed it as well so so that's good and I hope hope there's more, many more to come is this um It's impossible until it's done, right? The, uh, Correct. It's like that four-minute mile. I was know, about to say that, yeah. <laughs> it's impossible and then it's done and then, you know, 20, 30 other people are doing it in, in a matter of months. So, yeah, um, yeah so it's sometimes you just have to, to push beyond the, the glass ceiling. Cool. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? The injuries were the darkest moments. Um, I, you know, I had a period of time where I, I had significant injuries in, in my lower back um, to the point where I had a cyst growing in there and it was causing you know, lots of pain and numbness down one side and it was quite scary and I had prolapsed discs in my back. Um, concussions are very scary and, and horrible and, and um, really mess with your confidence and And at one point as well, I had, you know, two blown out knees in the, in the space of six months. So <laughs> lots of surgery and lots of setback along the way. And I think injuries are, um, you know, a time where it really does shake your confidence, but it also highlights, you know, um, what, what you want. You know, obviously for me, it was a point in time where I, I still really wanted to achieve my goals and I still believed that I could get there. Um, and through that injury period I, I learned that I, I used that time to to improve things like my mental game and and other aspects of my life so that I could come back to sport you know a lot stronger and, and balanced hmm. and I read you were the favorite to win the Olympic title in 2006 and then what happened yeah. Yes, I was um, looking good already. You know, I was early in my career. I, I um, was already winning World Cups and, and doing triple somersaults, which is the direction that I wanted to take, even though you didn't have to do that to win at the time. I, I wanted to go there. So I was looking pretty good. And, and um, the summer before, we were training in, in Lake Placid in, in the US and, and I had an accident on the water ramp um, and I you know, caught an edge on the water ramps, uh, which is where we train in the summertime into a swimming pool of uh, artificial jumps. And 
my knee kind of twisted, you know, 90 degrees up the, up the jump and I blew my ACL uh, six months before the Olympics. So it was a real, um, real shock to the system and it put a really big, um, you know, obviously not what you want leading into an Olympic Games where you're trying to, to um, you know, do, do the hardest tricks women had done before. So, so um, that was a real fight. I had to come back and have some radical surgery and, and um, give myself the best chance to make it for those Olympics. So I ended up having an ACL reconstruction, but not a traditional one, one where they used a, a donor graft. So it was a, called an allograft. So I had um, an Achilles tendon put in my knee um, for, as my ACL and, and rehabbed and worked really hard and made it back in time for... Torino 2006 and um, was looking really good. I did one World Cup before it and I, and I won it. So I thought, okay, I'm back on track. It's not ideal preparation, but I'm back kind of where I left off. And, yeah, the semifinals, just um, one jump away from the finals, you know, I, my, my leg gave out and, and re-tore that, um, that ACL in my knee. So it was kind of, yeah. That was that was a terrible moment. <laughs> it was all your world comes crushing down, as any athlete would would know. Injuries are always unwelcome, and that couldn't have been at, at a worse time. And in that period, after the 2006 Olympic until the 2010 Olympics, did you feel like throwing the towel? No, I didn't. Like even you know, I remember very shortly after blowing my knee and thinking, oh it's going to be a long road back because you know, I'd had to have uh, multiple surgeries to, to fix it. And I knew the road was going to be long and, and difficult, but I didn't want to give in. Like I didn't want to let that end my career um, because I knew that, yeah, I knew that I hadn't achieved my potential yet. I knew that, that I could get my knee better um, and still, you know, achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. I just didn't want to quit on that. So I, I really believed that I'd come back, but it wasn't easy. It was mm. definitely, you know, you got the physical injury, obviously, and, and building back your muscle and everything, and then the the mental injury and the, you know, the trauma that you also have to, to get over and then the fear of re-injuring, you know, is all, always on your mind as well. So it's just, yeah, I had to work hard um, physically but also mentally to be able to have the skills to, to be able to work through those things. Yeah. Um, when I did my research, I read your first career was in gymnastics. Uh, however, I couldn't really put all the pieces together. I read something like missed opportunities. I read something about conspiracies. What happened? Conspiracies. <laughs> That's the first I've heard. No, look, it was rather boring, really. Um, I, you know, I started off in gymnastics and I thought that was the, the road that I was going to take. And, um, like a lot of young gymnasts and it just, it didn't work out. Like I, I wasn't able to, to go to the right training centers at the right time. I wasn't allowed to join the elite program, which is the only way to get to the Olympics in Australia. It's a bit of a different system to the U S. So um, it just was, you know, a missed opportunities really there that, that um, I had the talent and I had obviously the right ingredients to, to be an Olympic gymnast, just, um, You can't, you can't miss, you know, opportunities and training at the right centres and um, under the right coaching. That makes all the difference. So um, I did well in, in um, my career, but I didn't do as well as I probably could have. And then as you grow, you get more injured, <laughs> you know, and it just wasn't working. So I decided to, to, to stop and call it quits and try something else. I wasn't sure if I'd like anything else, but... Um, as soon as I started to ski and, and that opportunity came up, um, you know, that was, I really loved it straight away. I'd never skied before. I didn't grow up skiing. Um, and, and so I, I began and yeah, I really enjoyed, um, the sport and, and, and the challenge that it was. And, um, you know, it was really exciting and thrilling to be able to, yeah, be immersed in this foreign world you know the winter culture was completely different to me so yeah I loved it straight away it was it was quite it highlighted straight away that it wouldn't have mattered what sport I was in it was the the process of being an athlete really is what I've, I've always loved and 
whether it was the summer or the winter Olympics, it didn't really matter to me as long as I went to and won one of those <laughs> was, was the aim. Yeah. Yep. And you, when from the moment you started, within less than two years, you made it to the Olympics. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I started um, skiing for the end of 99 and then by the Salt Lake City 2002 Olympics, which are in February, I was, I was competing there. So I spent a year learning how to ski and then a year jumping and bang, I was, you know, qualified and already, um, yeah, already competing at the Olympics. So no one really knew who I was. I come from nowhere and um, ended up making the finals in Salt Lake City and, and finished eighth place, which was a big shock and surprise, I guess, to everyone. But But for me, it was like, yes, no, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I went in thinking I would win, you know, I was so courageous and was prepared to take huge risks when I first started the sport. And it meant that I got good really fast, but it also meant that I got a lot of injuries and, and um, yeah, I probably pushed way, way harder than I should have at that time. So, But, yeah, you get there in the end. <laughs> cool. What was your best moment? Um, oh, there's been a lot, but definitely winning a gold medal is at the Olympics is, is, um, right up there. It's especially what I had gone through to get there. You know, I'd come off two knee reconstructions and people didn't think I'd come back. And, you know, I, and I won doing triple somersaults. I didn't play it safe. I didn't do an easy, I didn't back down. I, I still pushed and um, did things that I really wanted to. So so definitely Olympic, Olympic gold. Uh, Sochi bronze was equally amazing because that was when I, I did, you know, the, the quad twisting triple somersault in, in the super final where at the same thing I could have done an easier jump to secure a gold medal, one that I'd done, you know, more consistently or, you know, do the quad twisting triple, which I'd only done t twice in my whole life. So I took a big risk, but I'm glad I did it because, you know, I wasn't sure at that time if I'd ever get another opportunity in, If I didn't, I'd probably regret it. So that, that bronze medal felt, um, yeah, like, like gold <laughs> and only inches away from, like, landing it very cleanly. But, you know, there's always something undone, I think, in any athlete's career, unless you're Roger Federer. He's just perfect. <laughs> well, he yes doesn't have... No. <laughs> well, if, 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 you would, if you would look at it like this, he still... He has an Olympic gold medal in the doubles, not in the singles yet. So there's still uh -huh, something, so there's something I'm good. <laughs> anyway. I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I read on your website, women, winning and Olympics was always important to me, but going for greatness in the sport and doing something that no one had ever done before or was more, was more important to me. Where did this motivation come from? I think it's always been there. And if I wanted to be the most consistent and have the most World Cup wins, I would have done tricks that I knew I could land cleanly all the time, week in, week out. And, you know, a lot of athletes do that. But for me, I was always pushing. Like, I, I was always trying to push the envelope and do something harder and, and test myself. Um, and I'm not sure where that came from. But, um, yeah, I, I've, I guess over time I've enjoyed to be on that line, that fine line of being comfortable, yet then pushing the envelope to be uncomfortable and seeing, seeing if I could come through. And some people would call that stupid and crazy, but for me it was quite fulfilling because I know, I know that I got, you know, to, to my potential. Okay. Um, how does that play out now when you transition out of your career? What, what will be the next challenges? Um, well, I'm, I, you know, I did a lot whilst I was an athlete. So in that year that I had off in Torino, um, after Torino disaster, um, you know, that's when I started up my own business. Yes, I rehabbed that year and I spent a year out of sport and developing myself mentally and physically, but I also um, started my company Body Ice then. And it, be, and it came out of the disaster. I was struggling to find a, a product that I could ice with um, effectively that would just stay on my knee it would stay cold it would stay in place it would give me the compression that i needed and and um the product didn't exist in in australia um and so i flew home from those olympics and 
and I had the idea and I said, no, I'll, I'll do this. And I actually, on the plane, because I couldn't sleep, I was, every time I closed my eyes, you know, that nightmare, the nightmare of blowing money just kept on replaying. So I got my journal out that I normally write in and I started sketching the very first concepts of what would be body ice, which were joint specific ice packs that would not leak, that would stay in place and that would stay cold and, and give me that kind of natural pain relief um, that I wanted. So, so I kind of stuck my teeth into that. It was a really good distraction. It, um, it was a product that I really believed in, you know, and, and, and I went for it and I had it up and running within six months. And so what that gave me in that year off was balance because I had some perspective outside of sport. Um, I started studying again. I had a, a degree in um, applied science but that wasn't going to help me start a business. So I started studying um, business online and just picking the subjects that I wanted to kind of learn in. I didn't want to have a, have a degree or anything. I just wanted to learn how to run a business. And so that's what I did. I, I, I spent my time building body ice in that year off. And then I went back to sport a year later and I was rehabilitated. I had a, had a business that was already making a profit, you know, and, and I think that gave me a lot of, balance whereas before I was really you know one track mind just wanted to be the athlete and and didn't really have anything else that I was focusing on so um and you know that that gave me also security you know financial security and for a lot of Olympic sports you don't necessarily have that you have an Olympics every four years where you you have you know increases in in maybe finances if you're lucky and if you're well, not lucky, but if you're in the top, you know, top three in the world. Um, and, yeah, so that's not something you can always, it's not, it's not consistent. It's not something you can rely on. Sponsors are never certain. So Body Ice was, and that was, um, that was really, really amazing. That I think back now that I had no fear um, starting a business at all because I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted to fulfill my need. And then I figured that there was a lot of other people that were in the same position. And so, um, yeah, I remember walking into my knee surgeon's office with a body ice strapped onto my knee and I had, you know, the container had already landed. I had the product there. I had no idea how I was going to sell it. And um, I walked into his office and he's like, what is that? <laughs> I said, well, this is, this is body ice. This is my new business. It's ice and heat packs and they don't fall and they don't leak and they stay cold and they stay in place. And he's like, I'll order 500 of those. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I found my target market pretty quickly and orthopedic surgeons and um, yeah, I haven't looked back and, Every experience I've had in life um, has led to new product ranges. You know, I became a mother after the 2010 Olympics and, and realised that there was a need for, for recovery ice packs post-childbirth. So that, that was the start of my Body Ice Woman range, which is really a popular range. And then, you know, my babies turned into toddlers and they were always bumping and hurting themselves and needing that instant, you know, um, comfort from, from cold therapy, but something that wasn't very scary. So I created Body Ice Kids range. And, you know, now I, after that, I, you know, I suffered some back injuries and um, coming back to sport as a mother and started heavily into yoga. And, and now that's inspired my next range called Zone. So it's um, all these experiences and things that have really helped me, you know, recover and, and in life and just in general live better. Um, you know, I, I kind of bring to, to businesses or to my business and, and, and try to just solve problems that I have myself that will serve other people. So it's, it's been really fun. So I've always had the business side and I think that's given me um, other things to think about whilst being an athlete, which has given me balance. It also gave me then a really nice pathway into transition mm. after sport, which for me has been quite seamless because I was an athlete at one time and at the same time I was a mum of two boys and I was running a business and I was doing all, all three of those things. So coming into life after sport, everything was already there for me that I could just slip straight into. Mm. Yeah, that's going, oh, that was what, going, what was going on in my head now. I mean, there's, you have so many responsibilities. How do you do that in terms of time management? Mm. Yeah, it was difficult. Um, there was, you know, you have to prioritise things and 
I tried to travel as much as I could with my family. So I'd bring my boys and whether it was my husband coming along or grandparents or a nanny that could then obviously come and help me take care of the kids whilst I was training and competing that had to be looked after. Um, and then, you know, I, I built a team around body ice to make sure that things were kind of looked after if I was away and still managing things on the side um, from wherever I was in the world, but making sure that all the, all the logistics and everything was sorted on the ground here in Australia and had a good team that, that um, didn't need me breathing down their neck, that would just get things done. So that was really important to have that set up. And then a really supportive team for me as an athlete, you know, and that's medical staff and psychologists and coaches that um, really understood the different facets of my life and the responsibilities. And, yeah, so it was a matter of just juggling and shifting around priorities and just trying to focus on one thing at a time so um, that that I didn't become, I guess, overwhelmed. Because if you think about all of those things at once, you're not going to be able to do anything properly. So... Yeah, when I was, you know, Lydia, the athlete, out on, on the jumping hill, I knew that emails could wait, you know, and that the kids were being looked after and they totally have all their needs met and I could then just focus on me being the athlete. And then you come home and, you know, you mum again and <laughs> you forget about training <laughs> and, and you spend time with your kids. And then, you know, if you dedicate a couple of hours to, towards business, then everything else has to stop as well and you focus on that. So it's just kind of shifting one thing at a time, not trying to do everything at once is how I managed that. But you can do it. You just need a good support around you. Well, you did prove that it is possible, isn't it? Possible. <laughs> if you could travel back in time, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, what advice would you give a younger Lydia? Um... Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, to, to really, I guess what I didn't have was, was that good team around me when I first started and, um, and I didn't really have much of a mentor. Um, and so I was left to my own devices and I rushed things. I took big risks that I probably shouldn't. I jumped through pain and injuries and made them worse. So it was, um, yeah, just some, like, being really not not training harder but just training smarter that's something that i would tell my younger self mm. talking about risk i saw in the movie um when you became a mom you said you have to manage risk better mm. but still you did the amazing feat after you have been a mom right so you took the biggest yeah. risk after that so how does that how does that really uh Yeah, I guess managing risk is, is for me, okay, so, you know, I'm in aerial skiing over the years. I've developed, you know, some really good skills and, and experience um, and you really have to tap into that to then manage risk. So my fundamentals are, are very good. My experience is, is high. Um, and so when you have a day, maybe the weather is bad or maybe I'm not feeling 100% or maybe something's hurting in my body, um, or I'm not feeling confident, that's when you have to manage risk. That's when you have to say, hey, okay, maybe to not today <laughs> or maybe we wait or, you know, and, and just make a smart decision on when to push and when to pull back. And I became a lot better at that later in my career and whereas earlier I would have just pushed <laughs> and never really thought about it, you know, would have gone for it. But Yeah, becoming a mom and having that more experience really makes you, yeah, um, not question, but think about and, and make smarter decisions. I can relate to that. I'm not a mom, yeah. but I have, I have, I have kids. You're a parent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What are the habits that make you a successful person or athlete? Um, I've always had really good idea, like a vision of where I wanted to go. I think I always knew my direction. That, and that was really clear in, you know, in, in, in sport. It's probably not as clear in business, but I think, I think it is actually. I know the products that I want to develop and, and the need that they're going to fulfill and that's really clear. And then I have to, what's not clear is then, you know, figuring out how to do that on the way and how to do that successfully in the planning. And that's just planning. You know, that was some, a skill that I didn't start off very good at at all um i knew the goal but i didn't have really the strategy and the plan and um, and then 
that period between 2006 and 2010 when I was injured and I got really good at that. I got really detailed and, um, and I didn't make many mistakes, you know, in that period. So um, I know how to develop a strategy now and I know how to develop, you know, really compelling goals that are almost yeah, irresistible. So I think those two skills uh, mixed with a bit of hard, not afraid to, you know, put the hard work in, um, have been, you know, a real asset of mine. Cool. Do you have a morning routine? Yeah, I try to do yoga every morning. Um, so that's definitely something that, that makes me feel good. It sets me up for the day. Um, you know, now that I'm, uh, as an athlete, I did it religiously. Um, and that was, you know, a good hour before I would even start warming up. You know, I, I did a lot of yoga and um, a lot of breathing techniques and, um, and a lot of, you know, mental imagery as well and visualisation. That's always been um, really important to me. Nowadays, now I'm retired, I, you know, find myself slipping out of those routines a little bit from time to time. But, you know, managing a lot. So I try my best to do yoga every morning. Or I go for a surf or I do something active. How do you prepare yourself for important moments? Preparation <laughs> is key. You know, planning, preparation. You know, I do a lot of, I think, public speaking as well and mentoring. And, um, you know, you really have to prepare for those things in order to have the performance. You can't, nine times out of ten, you can't just fluke, you know, these things that, that you have to have some detailed planning and do the work and, and be honest with yourself that way. So um, I, I'm a planner these days. I'm not naturally one, but these days I know that that works and, and more details the better. Um, yeah, and then you just got to put the work in and then it will happen. And in your sport, you are up there? And there are just a few seconds until you have to go. So how do you make sure you're spot on when it counts? It's a really important few seconds, <laughs> those seconds before, before a jump. And um, I, I think the best jumps that I've ever had were ones where I was just so laser clear on, on the cues that I was thinking about, you know, one or two things, not lots of chatter in your mind. And I think they were the times where everything was quiet, where I was completely in that zone that a lot of athletes get in where you're just, you're feeling light, you're feeling laser focused. Um, you can see yourself doing the trick effortlessly and perfectly, and then you do it. And that's what you want. That's what I want at every jump. You don't always get that, but you, sh you strive for that, you know, and that's, um, that takes practice and it takes routine and it takes a lot of, you know, for me, it was a lot of mental imagery techniques of blocking other distractions out of the way, whether they're internal, your voice, you know, you, what you're saying to yourself or external, what you see and what the weather's doing, what other people are doing. So, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's best when everything is still and you're just clear, mm. you know, not too and, much conversation going on. Yeah. And then when you won that Olympic title, you pulled it off in the second jump, right? So you were with the back against the wall and then you did the best jump to secure the title. Yeah, so two, two jumps um, combined was, was what determined who would win. Um, and so after the first jump, I was sitting in second position and with one jump to go. And, and I knew that if I, well, I, I did the jump and I knew it was going to be really hard to beat. You know your competitors, you know what they can do. Um, and so I knew that I had given, you know, the best performance that I, that I could have um, on that night to secure the win. So I was pretty confident that, that I had won it. Cool. How do you overcome setbacks? You try and learn something. There's, I think there's, you know, there's always something positive that comes out of any situation. Um, not that sometimes when you're in it, you can't always see that, but I definitely see it in retrospect now. Um, and the important thing is, I always find is just to try and find ways to improve. So you, how, how can I make this better? You know, the setback, you accept it, it's happened, nothing much you can do, but let's work out how we can fix it um, and move on. Not only move on, but come out stronger because of it. 
And that's the same in business too. You know, you'd make mistakes or, you know, things don't quite, you try things and it don't quite work and, and you learn from them, you know, and, and often the numbers don't lie. It's all in the data mm-hmm. and it's a matter of, of picking apart the data and, and figuring it out. Yeah, just you can't, you can't quit, you know. You just got to figure it out. It's always like a, a problem-solving exercise. If you want to get better, then you have to want to overcome it obviously to to get through it yeah that leads us very well into the next question you were number two in the world for six years before you became number one in the world what did you do during that time to persevere and still believe you can do it yeah it was it was amazing that um i was number two in the world for that long um because to be honest i was injured for for 80 percent of that time and And it was a very frustrating position to be in. That was a period of constant injury, constant setback, um, and some tough competitors. And um, the reason why I was number two in the world is because I had to miss events. So I didn't do all the events and then I'd, I'd slip, slip a few points, you know, down. So, so I was definitely, you know, if I was completely healthy, I, yeah, That would have been a little bit different. May have been a little bit different, but you never know. <laughs> mm. So it was pretty good that I was number two in the world, given what I was dealing with at the time. Yeah. Okay. Who's your role model and why? Um, in sport, I, I often looked up to the male jumpers because they were the best in the world um, and I wanted to be like them. So it was the, the Belarusian jumpers who, who were the best, who still are. I, I believe the best in the world and, and I loved their style and um, I really looked up to them and, and wanted to, to, to be like them, not because they were guys, but because they were the best. So I know I wanted to benchmark myself against them. Um, you know, other really influential, influential people have been, um, you know, Nadia Comaneci early on as a, as a gymnast because she represented what everyone wanted, which is perfection. <laughs> You know, and, and she was always a, a bit of a driving force for me. Um, you know, and you look at the likes of, you know, Bruce Lee, which is, you know, some of his one-liners and philosophies were, were pretty profound and compelling. So, um, and then the high performers, you know, you've got your, yeah, your Roger Federer's that, you know, I'm the same age as him. So we came through our careers together and it's amazing to see him still competing and, and, and right you know, right up there still. So he's, he's had a pretty big influence as well. Yeah. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Um, probably my mental training coach, um, <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Hodges, who I started working with um, in, t- in 2006 after I injured myself. And, um, you know, he said to me um, early on, which at the time I was like really offended by, but he said to me, Lydia, you've created everything that has have ever happened to you. And I'm like, oh, you asshole. <laughs> like, that is so <laughs> Not my fault. Why am I always injured? Blah, blah, blah. But he, he was absolutely right. Every, everything, you know, every thought, every behavior, every decision to, you know, push through injuries and, and do that extra jump or not do that extra jump. That's all our, you know, our own decision making. And, and um, yeah, he's pretty much right. You know, we create everything that has happened to us. And I think we see that a lot these days, stress related injury uh, in not only injuries, but illnesses, hmm. you know, and people are, are manifesting that stress and it, it, and it turns into an illness and a sickness and, Yeah, you know, I think I think he's he was absolutely right. So I made a real, um, a bit, I guess, conscious decision at that point that every decision I I made was important, or every thought I had was important, whether it was a negative one, you know, or a positive one. It was all leading to then a behaviour, you know, which then would become a routine. So you have to change thoughts first to be able to have a positive routine. Hmm. so he was right we create everything that happens to us unless you're in an airplane crash or something like that that's that's not you can't you know there there is um, 
we can't do much about that. No. Yeah. Most things, you know, we, we have a pretty heavy hand in. Yeah. Your book, The Will to Fly, has been made into a movie. How did that work? Did people approach you to make a movie or did you actively go out to find someone to... No, I didn't. Didn't I got approached and um, I was, it wasn't a, the best time actually because I'd just become a mum and I, it was after 2010 and I'd just returned back to sport um, and I was going into to 2014 campaign. So it was a busy time because I was a mum, you know, I was juggling a business and I wanted to make things interesting and do the hardest trick a woman had done before. So, you know, to have then a, a film crew following me around was quite when I think about it now, quite a lot going on. But um, but they were interested in my story and so I gave them, you know, my film rights and, um, and the rights to my story. And I said to them, if at any time this interferes with my training in, in a negative way, you're gone, it's done. And so they, they made sure that they didn't. They were very good at being um, flies on the wall and just capturing capturing everything. So it worked out and it's a really great, Film. I think they did an amazing. Yeah. Mm. I think it's really cool. Back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? Back in the day, um, well, on snow, um, you know, you'd wake up, I'd do my yoga, I'd then have some breakfast, I'd go and warm up in the gym, get all my skis waxed and obviously prepared, um, hopefully the night before, go out and jump for about four hours so by the time you prepare the site and 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 um, warm up again and, and get going it's you know a good four hour block and then go back have some lunch um go to the gym you know you do your recovery do some more yoga have some physio do some mental training and then try and get some emails in and um and some mum time and eat and go to bed so it was kind of that way for for a long time um during the summer we we do more numbers so we we have two sessions of jumping a day um which is pretty full on as well so yeah it's a full-time job really when you think about it any professional athlete has the same yeah. these days yeah and um i know there are some places in australia where it snows but how often do you have to go abroad for idea mm -hmm training environment we, yeah uh, i mean we do have mountain ranges here and, and sometimes we trained in australia but um most of the time we were away so if you want to become a, a successful winter athlete in australia you need to be gone out of the country for about nine to ten months a year and that's and that's how it was Yeah. big long stints away just because we d we didn't have the summer training facilities here in Australia which now we are actually building finally um, and and then obviously you follow the northern hemisphere winter so yeah we were yeah it was it was nine to ten months away every year so it was a long time away yeah and to the best of my knowledge there are only five Olympic champions in the winter Olympics from Australia right and you are I think yeah, you are great. one of the one of the last, right? So since 2010, uh, no one has done yeah, it. Yeah, actually was the last, yes. Yeah. So that's been nearly 10-year anniversary. So hopefully in Beijing and the next Winter Olympics, we can, um, we can change that. Hmm. We talked about your company Body and Ice before, which is a range of ice packs and heat packs that foot, fit onto every body part. So you outlined your motivation to start it. Where is it accessible? Is it only in Australia or can you get it worldwide? Yeah, we are operating in some territories um, worldwide. Um, we're online, so anything is, is global these days. You know, bodyice.com and, and anyone in the world can we ship to any country in the world. So, um, but mainly with our focus is here in Australia. Okay. Any plans on, of expansion? Yeah, I think so. Um, We have some distributors in different countries for, for different ranges. So that's always, we're always keen to expand. So it's more looking at um, distributors in, in different territories now um, and finding people that, you know, are obviously interested to do that. Mm, cool. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Ooh, that's cool. Um, 
Hmm. I think it would be really interesting to hear from um, a surfer because surfing is now in the Olympics or skate skateboarding. Um, so that that would that would be interesting uh, for me, like a Stephanie Gilmore or Sally Fitzgibbons or someone heading into the Tokyo Olympics in a new sport. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> What's going on in the life of Lydia Lasila at this moment in time? Um, this moment in time, yeah, I'm, I'm just in, in work mode, really. Um, I'm mentoring a couple of athletes going into Tokyo, um, which is pretty cool. So I have that still that connection with sport. I am um, training the Olympic Committee Athletic Commission, so um, it's nice to still have an, a connection to sport and 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 some involvement um and yeah mum of two boys so the mum thing and traveling and we live in a pretty nice part of the world we live on the, the surf coast of victoria so at the beach and learning and improving my surfing which is definitely giving me the thrills that um that i need <laughs> and that adrenaline fix that, that i need so yeah it's a mixed bag it's it's really good I get like that And um, yeah, do it, do it quite a lot of different things, which keeps it all always interesting. Really cool. Where can people find you? Uh, mostly oh. on Instagram. I'm just Lydia Lassila on Instagram and in LinkedIn, Facebook, but yeah, probably spend more time on Instagram. Yeah, cool. <laughs> This social media thing is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> Lydia, thanks so much for your time. That was great. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.